Hi, I'm Winston Marshall, and welcome to Marshall Matters, my new show with The Spectator. I'm a musician, and I was a co-founding member of the band Mumford & Sons, which I quit in 2021. At the time, I had tweeted about a book critical of far-left extremism in the United States. All hell broke loose. I decided better to leave my band and save my bandmates the trouble than stay and bring them under the bus with me. Or stay and self-censor. So now that I'm on this side of the parapet, I thought I should use my voice to find out what are the totemic, difficult and taboo topics that we can't talk about. I'll be interviewing musicians, artists, composers, comedians, everyone in the creative industries to find out what indeed is the state of the arts. And I hope you'll join me. Hello and welcome to the Spectator offices in uh, London. And uh, today uh, I'm joined live from New York City by conductor and pianist Ignat Solzhenitsyn. Ignat is the conductor laureate of the Chamber Orchestra of Philadelphia and the principal guest conductor of the Moscow Symphony Orchestra. He's also an expert on the work of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, his father. Um, uh, Ignat, welcome. Thank you so much for making the time. Uh, I'm genuinely thrilled. Uh, in anticipation of this interview, I've been listening to your performances of Brahms, Schubert, Beethoven, and uh, Prokofiev. Uh, wait, Prokofiev, yeah. Excuse me. Uh, Prokofiev was not someone I was familiar with before this, um, because the classical world isn't a world I'm actually that familiar with. So uh, it's a world I'm hoping I might learn a little bit about today. Wonderful, Winston, and uh, so so pleased to be with you. And uh, conversely, I, I hope to learn more about uh, about your part of the music world uh, that I'm not so familiar with. So wonderful to be with you, and looking forward to to chatting. Thank you. Um, so uh, I want to start off by quoting you, if I may. Uh, you said something in a previous interview that has really resonated with me. You said, we play, study and suffer for music for some bigger purpose. And it starts by expressing a wonderfully unselfish act, not just expressing me, but expressing another person. I think the context of this was that you were describing uh, your father as uh, believing an artist has a greater responsibility than just to express him or herself, and that that implies truth is not relative, that we can strive for it through art, and that that is the tradition of Russian literature. Writing had a purpose larger than their life or ego. Uh, so jumping in there quite uh, heavy guns, but for me that sort of implies that that art and music is a moral obligation is do you feel that way uh it's a it must be classified as a uh, frightfully retrograde and and uh out of fashion uh, approach i imagine but to me it's obviously true it's obviously so uh if we take art and and, and i suppose so much of it can, is semantics so much of it is well what do you mean by that term uh if we think of art as the highest, the most pure, the most truthful form of human expression, if we think of art as a bridge across which humans of very different, totally different backgrounds, persuasions, etc., totally different people can understand each other better. Uh, if we think of art as a necessity for human existence in a way that does not exist, does not occur, I think is the correct term, in the natural world, uh, per se, in the animal world, uh, as much as we might love our dogs or cats or other pets, but we see, and I think most of us recognize their their existence is, is uh, not devoid of the spiritual plain or of something more than just food, but it's it's limited, obviously. Whereas for us, uh, this uh, notion that that um, there is more to life than stuff, and there's more to life than property or property rights even, uh, and 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 uh, th th there's there's something beyond that, and there's something we need in our lives. Maybe not every one of us, maybe not at every stage of our lives 
But at some point, most of us hunger for something more. And to me, more or less, those are some of the ways we can define art. And if art is defined that way, then yes, then absolutely. Uh, that is the, um, something like that is, a, is, is an approach that, uh, 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 that I feel is, as I said, inevitable and, and, and uh, obvious to me. Has it always been obvious to you? Is that, is that presumably you, were, you were started music at a very young age, and so being able to articulate what you think about the, the importance of art as you've just done, is that, 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 was that instinctual to you from an early age, or, or is it something that you grew to appreciate as you, as you got older? I'm sure it's evolved and, and deepened. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to think so, but uh, certainly it was in the in the water, as they say, in my in my childhood because uh, I grew up, of course, in the family of a writer, and in uh, in a family where you, you mentioned the tradition of Russian literature. In my family, literature was so deeply valued, Russian literature included, but. Not only Russian literature, of course, mm. all the the great heritage of of, of the past and present. Uh, so, and naturally that extends to to theater and to uh, to uh, painting, uh, I suppose, and certainly to my eventually chosen métier uh, to to music. Uh, so, I would say how I feel about all this is more or less how I've always felt about it, except I'm sure. When I was beginning my 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 life's journey and beginning my journey as an artist, these th thoughts were perhaps not less cogently uh, expressed in my own in in my own mind. Yeah. But I think the basics were were there because again I think the basics are part are part of a natural order. I think. Was there was there a moment for you where you felt? when the decision to pursue music and the de 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 decision to, to pu uh, pursue truth within this art form, uh, did that happen? Do you, do you have a, a memory of that happen? Was there maybe a piece of music that so moved you that you felt that it was this was how you wanted to live your life, this is what you wanted to give your life to? Because as you said, there is a lot of suffering involved in, in creating and practicing and it's 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 not, it's not easy, it's, it's really a huge labor. Um, so to make that commitment is, is I think, a big thing for all musicians. Is, is, was there a moment for you or uh, how did that come about? It's hard to say that there was one moment, I won't say that, but there were, because the simplest way to answer that question is to say that as soon as I uh, learned what's what, and I mean that in the most rudimentary sense. Uh, in other words, it's kind of as soon as I learned to first learn to play the piano. Of course, I wasn't thinking about conducting yet. Uh, it, I, I knew somehow my life would have to be in it or connected with it. Um, I, I just knew that. Now there were there were, of course, great moments along the way of recognition, of illumination. Uh, the first time I heard a Beethoven symphony was, it, it so happens, in my father's study. And I had walked in, knocked on the door, and, and, and he said, come in. And I came in. He was working, as he usually was. But he would very often li be listening to music on the radio or on some of his old vinyl records, which, of course, vinyl is now back in fashion, <laughs> which is lovely. But uh, and, and I don't know which one it was, but it was one of the Beethoven symphonies. But I didn't even know it was Beethoven. I just stopped in my tracks and and listened and he listened and we just sort of both listened for some period of time and 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 i then finally i i asked this what is this who is this and uh, he said that's beethoven and so that that was a that that and i wish i knew which symphony but of course it doesn't really matter because what matters that they're all nine of them are of course uh uh uh, uh as great as anything ever written. But the, the point is that it spoke to me so directly, so personally. Another moment I remember is um, another composer who would become extremely 
important in my life and has has continued ever ever since is uh, my compatriot Shostakovich. But I heard his Fifth Symphony, which is actually a very famous piece and probably his most famous symphony. But at uh, eleven years old, I hadn't heard I hadn't heard his symphonies, and I certainly hadn't heard the Fifth. And I was at a summer music camp where the orchestra, uh, not very well, but well enough to convey some sense of the of the genius and of the power and as you say the suffering in that music played played this piece and and it, it was just overwhelming it was overwhelmingly powerful uh overwhelmingly important to experience that kind of direct power even more so of course live than um as you and i know than just on a, on a recording so so those are a couple of moments that come come to mind but i think the the the, the key the key point is that just uh, from 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 early age i just uh, and by the way i didn't start playing that early which can be two years old or three years old very commonly but in my case was i didn't start at all until six and i didn't begin proper lessons till nine so but by by pianist standards that's on the late side but on the other hand very very soon after that i knew my life needed to be uh, somehow closely connected or just in with music and in music wow so an obsession then that that you've pursued through that time there's there, there's something that 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 resonated for me because i remember uh start, when i started for music it, it was never um I, I never really philosophized about it i just sort of did I did it. I needed to do it. And then uh, when I started trying to articulate it, uh, I articulate it for me, it was, I needed to express my, uh, this is me expressing myself. But what you've got me thinking about really is this, it's actually, there's a, a moral, this moral obligation idea, this idea that actually it's, it's the pursuit of truth and the, and the, and we owe it to our neighbors, to our, our fellow man to uh, pursue this art. Uh, it's just kind of thrown my my week a little bit off because I, I never th thought about it in that in that way and and has I found it very it's been really challenging me uh, in a very positive way I think hopefully. it's a wonderful thing Winston that, that what you're saying and in, in your response and of course we it's it's very personal and and I'm sure each one of us can and should articulate his own way of thinking that and so far be it for me to kind of impose that as a as a prescription on any, but just it's really a very personal interpretation of of uh, of what it means to be in in our case you and I a musician, and 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 really it's I th I think it's just part and parcel of the broader idea. I think it's still universally accepted, rather universally accepted, at least in the Western world, uh, that um, that we are each of us part of a broader whole whether of a broader group, whether it's our neighborhood, whether it's our city, our country, our common humanity. And as part of that community, uh, we each contribute what we can. We each contribute the, our best, one hopes. And we all have diverse talents and diverse areas in which we can bring something to contribute. And so if one senses that ability and that talent and that, as, as you say, need to to articulate and express something, something maybe greater than ourselves, then yes, I think there's a moral obligation to to serve to serve others. Uh, partly, isn't it? I, I hope that's not too too grandiloquent to suggest that it's it's about more than just me and my needs. It's about more than just me maximizing my. Uh, uh, market value, or whatever is the, uh, the the economic term for that, it's it's about con contributing something, mm -hmm. and that does feel like a moral obligation, even if it's a, a small one on a small scale of one individual. Um, one of the purposes of of this uh, interview is, uh, and the various people I want to interview, is to look at freedom of expression within the creative industries. And I know very little about the classical world, but I have seen various articles over the last couple of years um, about how uh, 
the classical world is coping with in these sort of uh, culture wars and and uh, some uh, headlines suggesting that Beethoven's too white and too male and being uh, cancelled in some places and uh, racial quotas for uh, orchestras and uh, resignations over decolonization of the of the Western canon, things like this. Now, are these real things? Do, are these palpable? Do you, do you have you come across these kind of phenomena within classical music? Do you um, do, are they something to be worried about, or may they are they perhaps overblown, uh, exaggerated uh, ideas? Well. Yes, they are a concern to me and, and to many of many colleagues. I, I think to most of my colleagues, but of course I speak only for myself. It is true that headlines have a way of being just that, being outsized. And, and it's hard to tell the complete context. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't say that these examples that you've brought up, which are all true, unfortunately, uh, I wouldn't say that they're prevalent or dominant in the classical field yet. Uh, but broadly speaking, they concern me because of the utter misunderstanding, I think, of, of human nature that uh, stands behind them and of the potential for for destruction that is inherent in them it's just speaking speaking broadly mm -hmm. and i think that this is uh this is a big big concern in in the world of arts and really in the broader world in the broader western world um at the moment it's a big concern because uh the very values that have made the West what it is, for better or worse, uh, are, it seems, not only under attack, but are are being doubted uh, by sort of by the very cultures or countries or communities that have brought them forth. And I'm thinking in particular about values of tolerance and values of uh, diversity of opinion and, and values of grace. Uh, listening to another's point of view, respecting another's point of view, making room for many points of view, and so forth. Uh, these are all... These are real concerns. And um, are they, do you feel like with your contemporaries, that are, th are these at least conversations that can be had? Or, um, uh, uh, or is there uh, a feeling that actually it's a dangerous conversation to be had? Um, uh, Winston, the, the, your question is uh, appropriate and very depressing because, because think about what you just asked, and I, I know you have, uh, uh, is it a dangerous conversation to have? What point have we arrived at where, again, thinking of, and I just don't uh, feel qualified to speak about broadly the whole world because mm. there are many context and many cultures and many different histories but but i do feel quite confident speaking about um uh, one of the worlds is, is is this is the is the traditional uh western uh western under western world and western understanding of tolerance uh particularly the one that comes from english common law uh and and the one that has been uh promulgated and amplified and established in in the United States with that very famous uh, and enduring Constitution, uh, and how can there be how can that conversation be dangerous? How can it be dangerous to exchange points of view? How can it be dangerous to have a disagreement? Mm -hmm. But it seems that uh, we are heading precipitously uh, in in that direction, and uh, yes, I think that people are afraid. Uh, simply to, to say, really to say exactly what they think. It's a different question that it may not always be civil to say everything one thinks. I think we learned that from our mothers or from, from, our, from our fathers, that you don't have to say everything that's on your mind. Yeah, and it's that, called tact. Just, 
<laughs> exactly. Question of tact, tact and question of good manners and a question of be, simply being kind. Sometimes it's kinder to, 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 to be mindful of others. But broadly speaking, what, one ought to be able to speak freely and to, and to engage in discourse. And how else can one learn and, and, and maybe change one's mind um, other than through a free exchange of ideas? Uh, this, this is a great concern. But yes, I think people are frightened and uh, unwilling to speak freely because one never knows who's listening or who's reporting. You know, that's another aspect that I don't know uh, how you feel about it and what your sense of it is, but but even just the faint whiffs that that I come across, and it's I think it's more than that of the notion of telling on people, the notion of reporting. Mm. As soon as a an, a, a, a view that somehow uh, ranges outside an increasingly narrow orthodoxy is expressed, it must be. Okay, not engaged with, not defeated, not exposed for the foolish or or uh, retrograde view that it surely is, but it must be reported. It must be reported so the appropriate authorities can deal with it. And this is this is Stalinist. Funky language. This is this is awful. Yeah. And surely that's not the way to foster understanding and community and uh, really that 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 kind of universal. Uh, tolerant society that I think everyone is after, I think. It, it, but, but, but how we get there, the means matter a lot, don't they? Absolutely. I mean, in, in, in the pop world, my personal experience has been um, having sort of uh, been reported on or whatever, uh, is that a lot of musicians, some of them very well known, have reached out um, privately. Um, and some of them are prepared to uh, speak out um, uh, in defense, but actually my experience isn't, uh, uh, doesn't necessarily bode well for speaking out. And um, uh, I, 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 can un I, I sense within pop music a lot of people feeling like they can't speak. And actually, again, this is, this is why I value a conversation like this, is hopefully just by pushing the conversation, nudging it a little bit, it'll just make it easier and easier for us to, to speak and make mistakes, maybe we'll get it wrong and have these conversations so that others can feel like they can, they can speak uh, more freely. Well, the next thing I wanted to talk about is that in the West, I've noticed over the last few years that uh, your father's writings are cited more and more commonly. Uh, uh, and perhaps, perhaps it's something I, uh, I just notice it more, but I, I do, I do also sense that uh, I read Aristotle's uh, thoughts uh, and it's, it's often quoted uh, in articles I, I read and um, he's quoted at length in the work of Dr. Jordan Peterson. He's, uh, there's a book called Live Not By Lives by Rod uh, Dreher, I think his name. And um, certainly in my life, I mean, I quoted your father in my resignation letter um, uh, from his essay, Live Not By Lies. Um, it seems that perhaps his work is, is resonating again precisely because of these things we've, we've been talking about, this, this sense of censorship and, and uh, the, the, the way of the West at the moment. Do you have an insight into that? Do you, think, am I, do you think I'm right in thinking that his work is being cited more at the moment? Yes, I do. And I think that uh, it has to, well, it, it has to do with, uh, it has to do with maybe first, firstly, with the fact that there was a, a backlog of uh, tr his translations of his works into English of all languages, mm. uh, because of various, un essentially, uh, mundane and logistical issues. But uh, there, recently, in the last eight to ten years, they are coming out. Uh, kind of that that backlog is being is being remedied. Uh, yeah. And it, his books are coming out with increasing frequency for the first time in English, important social needs and texts. And so that is eliciting a new new generation of readers, of commentators, even now of scholars who are specializing in social needs and, 
and uh, in short, there's a broader uh, renaissance of uh, engaging with Solzhenitsyn's art and his thought. Then the specific context that you mentioned, I think, is is absolutely evident because to the extent that Western societies are increasingly subject or tolerant of this notion of, for example, censorship, censorship used to be so to the extent that that's happening. Yes, Solzhenitsyn's words and and I, and thoughts are gaining uh, renewed application in contexts that for which they were never intended, hmm. except that as all great art, I think they are universal. And so they are effortlessly applied uh, to, in this case, to the current uh, cultural climate uh, in, uh, in, in, in the West. You mentioned live not by lies. And of course, you mentioned it so powerfully in your letter. This is a text I've known since very young age. It's a text that I virtually know by heart. Of course, it's not very long, four or five pages. It, but it's a text I always associated with its time and place. Mm -hmm. What was maybe just 30 seconds about what is Live Not By Lies for our viewers. Live Not By Lies was the final message of Solzhenitsyn, his final text that he wrote uh, before his forced exile to the West in February of 1974. So it was a kind of a, a kind of a last will and testament uh, to, to the Russian people. Uh, not that he was planning to die or, or expecting to die, and, but, but just he, he didn't know when he would return, if ever, of course. And he summed up his credo about how he had tried to live in those last, well, actually his whole life, but certainly those last so many years of his life in the Soviet Union and how he didn't even maybe to say implore others to live, but how he, a, a way that he showed that could be possible. In this way, as you well know, Winston is saying, you don't have to be a hero. You don't have to stand up in the public square and condemn injustice because it's too much to ask. You have a family, you have children, you have a job you're not courageous by nature. You're not a superhero. You're just a guy or a girl, a woman. Uh, you're just a person. And okay, so you don't have to be a hero, but what you perhaps ought to consider is do not participate in the lie that is all around you in, in Soviet communist totalitarian society. It's all around you. It's at your workplace. It's in your home. It's on the streets and just don't participate. And he gives examples of how if of how one could do that. Small steps a normal person, a simple person can take that then if more people did that could have a uh, cascading effect. So that was a, a, a suggestion meant for those times, meant for that place, for that country that was enslaved by an evil, anti-human, despotic regime. To think that that advice now can be so relevant to a free people, free society in the West is uh, until very recently unimaginable. Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right. It seems to have direct connection to choices that people can do or do not make in in in, uh, in the west today it's funny for you to describe it as a sort of gentle uh, uh text because for me actually uh, and i've read it a lot this year uh, particularly before um resigning from my band or quitting for the band and actually i just wanted to if i may read one particular paragraph which i read over and over this year and I didn't take it at all as a light, like, it, I took it as a, like, a very, um, a, a command even, uh, uh, something I felt, it, it, it resonated, it, it hit me so deep that, uh, uh, that I, there was nothing gentle about how I interpreted it, let's put it that way. Um, 
And he who is not sufficiently courageous to defend his soul, don't let him be proud of his progressive views, and don't let him boast that he is an academician or a people's artist, a distinguished figure or a general. Let him say to himself, I am a part of the herd and a coward. It is all the same to me as long as I am fed and kept warm. I, that's not a gentle uh, piece of writing. That, I, I, I want, that, that's, that's tough. That's, like, that's a, a brutal, almost... Uh, um, it's ruthless, I would say, even. Have I, I mis- uh, misinterpreted I don't, I don't, its intention? I don't know if I, I see it the same way or read it the same or hear it the same way as you do. I know I understand what you're saying, mm-hmm. of course, and it, it, it's it's strong. But I, I think, I don't know if I would use the word gentle, and if I did, maybe that wasn't the right word. But what I, what I mean to say is there is that this appeal is meant to be, and I think it is, if one reads the whole text, as of course, of course, as you have, is, is voluntary. This is, I think it's important to know and, and, and to understand that he is not, this is not a, 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 a um, like it or not, you have to do this. Or if you don't do this, you're consigned to eternal perdition. Mm. Uh, it's, he's saying this will only work if individual persons will stand up. And he says it towards the end, if you remember, he says, it shouldn't be so fr- Winston, this, 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 this echoes something you said a few minutes ago. He said, maybe through our conversation, you said, maybe somebody else will be emboldened to just, uh, as you say, to nudge the conversation a little bit, to be a little more tolerant, to be a little more broad. And Solzhenitsyn says in Live Not By Lies, there are already persons today, and he says, even dozens of them, so there aren't many, <laughs> maybe, maybe some dozens. So, but who are living this way, who are living not by lies. And he says, so it shouldn't be that hard for you, dear reader, uh, to consider joining them. It shouldn't be that hard. You know, you could do it starting today. You don't have to wait. Somebody's already doing it and they're not being shot or killed as admittedly in uh, earlier, even uh, even happier times of the socialist paradise under Lenin and under Stalin. Okay, now this is 1970s, the period of stagnation. Uh, you may lose your job, you may go hungry, but but you won't be shot, you won't be killed, simply for refusing to participate in a lie, at least in most cases. And he and he says and he makes that distinction between violence and lies, and how intertwined they are, but also how most people, even in the Soviet Union of the 70s won't encounter violence directly. They will encounter, vi- some, some of them will encounter violence some of the time, but all of them will, will encounter or participate in lies all the time. So that's the only uh, maybe dis- uh, 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 d- d- uh, distinction in angle that I would say is, is that the words are strong, but yeah, he, he's, he just says, if you don't do it, at least be honest with yourself what that makes you it makes you a coward it makes you yeah so those are strong words but but um but i think he knows that i'm sure he knows knew that uh, his appeal only can only work to the extent that it's voluntary to the extent that people want to rise uh, from all fours Mm -hmm. and to stand up on on two feet as a human being should yeah, that, that's uh, just, I'm sure that, that that piece of of writing will be read for centuries to come. And actually, I discovered it myself quite late uh, of, of the, the bulk of um, Solzhenitsyn's uh, work. And, and yeah, it's, it's easily the most profound, and that's saying a lot, uh, of, of what I've read. Um, so um, I'd love to ask you, uh, as a last question, what are you excited about? What, what is on the horizon? And um, what, when can we hear you uh, next performing? It, it's, uh, it's been a long pause, hasn't it, for, for many of us? And uh, what a strange, strange, strange time. But one hopes that it seems to be finally life in general, in most places coming, trending more or less in the right direction. 
and uh, certainly one feels that in, in, in music and in the music world. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to be coming back to concerts and, and as a matter of fact, coming to London very soon. And uh, oh, would, would love, love to see you there uh, performing at Wigmore, uh, Wigmore Hall uh, in London in February. So Wonderful. God willing and uh, COVID regulations willing, uh, you know, that, that will happen and uh, performing a, a program of late Shostakovich, speaking of, uh, at Wigmore and uh, looking forward Shostakovich to is the Soviet, uh, is cellist, is it, am I right? Is the great, have I got that that's, right? No, that's Rostropovich. Oh, sorry. Yeah, a, a lot of the sort of similar or rhyming names, certainly in Russian. But uh, so Rostropovich, Mstislav Rostropovich is the great cellist and conductor. Okay. Uh, Dmitry Shostakovich is one of the great Russian composers. Also was a terrific pianist, but that's essentially a footnote now uh, because of this, his tremendous stature as a composer. Uh, 1906 to 1975. Uh, and so he would, the revolution came when he was 11. And so really he lived his whole adult life under the Soviet regime and died. Uh, under the Soviet regime, and his his work is some of the most searing and probing and powerful testament to to human suffering and to the to the depths of human self-examination uh, to what how deeply we can pr probe ourselves until we hit not just raw, you know, meat, I guess, but hit bone or, or hit whatever hides behind the bone, the, the essence of, 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 of humanity. Um, I think Shostakovich does that in a, in a, not only in a moving, but really in a frightening and uh, deeply thought provoking way and, uh, and, and emotion provoking way. And uh, I guess those are some of the reasons that for me, he is so, so important. And so, and bringing two works that, that were written in the last year of his life, um, 1974, 75, to the Wigmore stage. Wonderful. Well, I very much look forward to it. Uh, as you say, God willing, it'll happen. And um, God willing, the music will be back. Um, thank you so much for your time. Uh, a real, uh, really special for me. And um, uh, yeah, thank you for sharing all of that and speaking. Winston, uh, you, you, uh, you are welcome. And thank you for asking me to join you. And uh, I'm sure you've heard it a lot, but I think it has to be said, thank you for what you've done. And I think that what you've done uh, is precisely, I think, the sort of thing that my father was talking about, which is to value something ineffable above material things. And uh, uh, in your case, as you've said, I think it would, would have been much easier to just 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 go along, continue with the with your amazing success and with your fame and, and, and everything that goes with it. And sure, that would be the easiest. Protect your investment, protect your etc. But you did something uh, simple and yet incredibly brave. Simply by really, as I see it, defending your right and therefore each of us the right of each of us to speak freely and so for this i thank you very much and i know that many of our colleagues do whether publicly or more likely privately and uh bravo ignat solzhenitsyn thank you so much thank you winston <laughs>